Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. And though she has studied long and written much about the real value of teaching our children art, indeed the creative arts generally, it was in late 2007 that my guest today, together with a colleague, Lois Hetland, wrote a piece for the Boston Globe that perhaps put the matter most squarely before us. Art for our sake was Boston College psychology professor Ellen Winner's title. School art classes matter more than ever, but not for the reasons you think. And at a time, at least pre-Obama, when so many of us have bemoaned the fact that seemingly everywhere economically hard-pressed schools are further and further limiting the exposure of our children and my grandchildren received to the arts, music, drawing, dance, the fine arts. I want first to ask my Radcliffe BA, Harvard PhD guest, just what that subtitle means. School art classes matter more than ever, but not for the reasons you think. That's a fair question. It's your title. <laughs> well, there is, has been a long tradition in this country to claim that arts education is of great value because it will boost grade point average and will boost test scores. Practical argument, huh? A practical, instrumental argument. It just happens, however, not to be true, and even if it were true, it's not a particularly good argument to make for the arts. Um, about 10 years ago, my colleague Lois Hetland and I decided to take a cold, hard look at the evidence about whether or not the arts in schools really do raise test scores. And so we did a search from, uh, for everything that was published or unpublished since 1950 and written in English, and um, found that there were actually about 200 studies looking at this question. And we decided to review the evidence and use what's called a meta-analysis, which is a quantitative synthesis of the evidence. And you have to take studies that are similar in order to meta-analyze them. So we ended up finding 10 different groups of studies. Each group had similar studies in them, and then we did a meta-analysis on each one. So for example, one of the study, one of the piles looked at whether um, music listening increased spatial reasoning. Another pile looked at whether music training increased mathematical performance. The pile that got us into the most trouble was the pile of studies showing, uh, testing the claim that when the arts are infused into the curriculum, or when students take lots of different kinds of arts courses, test scores go up. And what we showed in our 10 meta-analyses is that the claims that are being made are way, go way beyond the evidence. Seven out of our 10 meta-analyses showed there was absolutely no causal relationship between studying the arts and the kind of cognitive outcome that they were looking at. And it was usually test scores, which means verbal test scores and mathematical test scores on multiple choice tests. So you were attacked then because it seemed that you were opposed to the teaching of the arts. We were vilified. We had people call us up saying, you are ruining quality arts education for the children in this country. You should never have done this research. You should have buried your findings. And these were prominent people calling us up. Um, we argued that, in fact, 
First of all, we have a duty to tell the truth. We're scientists, we want to find out the truth. We didn't say that it's impossible to get transfer of arts learning to other areas. We simply said the research hasn't shown it. And in fact, there's, there's a lot of problems with, with the research that has been done, which I can go into. Um, but in fact, there is no evidence yet that studying the arts raises test scores. But people felt that it was the only way that we could get the arts to have a foothold in our schools, and as the arts were becoming increasingly vulnerable to budget cuts, arts advocates felt that we had to hang on to the claim that the arts raised test scores because that would be the only way to keep the arts in school. So they were well-meaning. They wanted to keep the arts in schools. We too were well-meaning. We thought that the most important thing to do would be to change the conversation about why we need the arts in schools. Because to justify the arts in terms of a secondary bonus effect, which may or may not be true, is actually very bad for the arts because all you need is some smart superintendent to say, ah, oh, we're just teaching the arts to raise test scores. Why don't we just have another hour of test score prep? That'll certainly do the job much better. Pretty sad commentary, isn't it, upon A, the role of the arts in our schools, and B, the role of those who were so, quite so critical of you. It's a very instrumental pragmatic kind of reasoning, and it's a kind of reasoning that doesn't stop to think about what it is that we want children to learn from the arts. What is it? Well, after we were attacked roundly as being against the arts, which we weren't, uh, Lois Hetland and I went on to another project um, with two other researchers, Kim Sheridan and Shirley Vinema. We decided to study what it is that the arts really do teach. Because one of the problems we found in our meta-analyses is that the studies we uncovered were, none of them looked at what students were really learning in an art form. They just said, oh, students are studying the arts, let's see if their test scores go up. And by the way, there is a correlation. If you look at students who do take a lot of arts, they do have slightly higher test scores than students who don't. But that's a correlation, it's not a cause. And if you look at the experimental studies where you take kids who are the same, divide them up into two groups, and give one group arts and one group something else, the arts group does not do better after the treatment. But let's talk about the correlation. Okay. What do you think that is? Well, you probably heard the claim that students who study the arts in our country do better on their SATs. And if you haven't heard the claim, it is uh, the Music Educators National Conference puts out that claim every year in their newsletter, and they get it from the College Board. We took the College Board data and analyzed it ourselves and looked at what the average test scores, average verbal and math test scores were for students who took zero arts courses in high school, one, two, three, and four. And we found, yes, indeed, there is a rise. With every year of arts courses, up to, eight, up to um, three courses, test scores rise, both for verbal and for math. After three, there doesn't seem to be any change. Three and four are the same. Um, so why might that be? First of all, we cannot say that the arts are causing the change, because these are not, this is not a, this was not based on, a, on an experimental study. This was simply a correlational analysis. There's all kinds of non-causal reasons. I mean, students who come from families that value the arts and academics may do well in both. Students who have a great deal of drive may do, have, be driven to do well in academics as well as in arts. Um, my favorite explanation is a Machiavellian one. What's that? Well, I noticed that the, the relationship between number of arts courses taken and test scores got stronger and stronger over a 10-year period between the mid-90s to about, uh, between 1990 and 2000. And it occurred to me that it's getting increasingly hard to get into elite colleges, and students are doing everything they can to get in. One of the things they're doing is building up community service resumes, but I think another thing they might well be doing is building up arts resumes, because it's no longer enough just to have all A's and straight top scores on your SATs. You need something else. That is Machiavellian. Yes. But not on your part, <laughs> on, on their part. It's just part. a sheer speculation. Well, what's your own evaluation of that? Um, of that reason, not the Machiavellian reason, but that the uh, family background, uh, the kind of interest in the home, mm -hmm. the kind of native intelligence, and the kind of uh, interest in life and in things right. um, accounts for the parallel, the correspondence right. between doing, taking the arts 
and doing well in the SATs. Right. Well, you know, we don't know what the reason is at the moment because we haven't done the proper studies. So it may well be family background. It could also be that strong schools are good in both the arts and academics. If you look at our best schools, they're usually true? good in both. I mean, let's say you go to a, a school like, uh, like Andover. That's very strong in the arts and very strong in academics. So I think the best schools are strong in both. I'm uh, glad you turn... picked Andover, my grandson's school. Great <laughs> school, too. And one of the uh, co-authors of our book, Studio Thinking, The Real Benefits of Visual Arts Education, Shirley Venema, is one of the arts teachers there. Um, you know, they did the same kind of study in the UK and in the Netherlands, and they got very different findings. In the UK, they actually found that the more arts students, the students who were placed into the arts track actually did worse on their comprehensive exams at the end of high school than students who were not in the arts track. And they didn't say, oh, that means that the arts causes academic performance to go down. They had a perfectly plausible explanation for that, which is that in, in England, students who are struggling academically are often counseled out of, the, out of the academic track and are counseled into the arts track. We don't do that with our students who are struggling. We give them remedial education, but we don't say you better go into the arts or you better take more arts classes. What do you think about the, uh, the motivation there or the understanding of the human mind that leads to that kind of tracking and then saying you can't do academic work, just do the other thing? Yes, I think it's very unfortunate but uh, to think that, oh, the arts aren't really important, but, it, but they are hitting on something, and that is that you can be very strong in the arts and not strong in a traditional academic area. And you can also be very strong in academics and weak in the arts. So I think for students who, one of the reasons that I think arts education is so important, and it's just one, is that there are many students who really are strong in the arts who are not going to go on in academics. And if schools only offer core academic subject matters, those students will never discover their strengths. Discover their strengths. That's the key to it all, isn't it? The multiple strengths. Absolutely. Uh, In the Netherlands, they did the same study, and they found simply no relationship at all. So why is it that we find a relationship? England doesn't. England finds a negative relationship. The Netherlands finds no relationship. I think it, it tells us we better be cautious about... Um, assuming that there's a causal relationship. Also, I wanted to point out that the the difference in test scores between students who take three years of arts and students who take no arts is, um, it may be about 30 points on average, and that may be about worth about three multiple choice questions. So it may be statistically significant, but it's probably not educationally significant. Also, Elliot Eisner, a professor of arts education at Stanford, looked at these same data, and he said, Okay, students who specialize in the arts get higher test scores. Maybe students who specialize in anything get higher test scores. And he looked at students who take four years of chemistry or four years of physics or four years of English AP, and he finds that no matter what, students who specialize do better than students who don't. And in fact, if you specialize in chemistry, you do much better on your SATs than if you specialize in the arts, which is not surprising since the, the SATs are measuring the kinds of things that you learn in Makes chemistry. Makes a lot of sense. Right. What would you like? Uh, funny question. What would you like your uh, studies to result in? Well, you know, we have gone on to do some more work in this area. We spent um, uh, two years looking at what is taught in high-level visual arts classes at the high school level. We videotaped over 38 three-hour-long classes in two different schools, and then we spent a year coding what we saw being taught. And our goal there was to say, what are students supposed to learn in our best visual arts classes? And once we figure that out, then we can find out, do they learn it, and does that transfer to another area? I'm actually not opposed at all to the idea of looking for transfer. I don't believe that transfer, that transfer means the idea that you learn something in the parent domain, say the arts, and that makes you better in some other area, say math. So, so far we didn't find any evidence for it, but I think one of the reasons is because nobody stopped to think, what are kids actually learning in the art form, and then what kind of plausible transfer might there be? And if you stop to think about it, like that, you're not going to say, oh, it must be verbal and math test scores, because that's not the kinds of things that the arts teach. But after spending these two years studying these visual arts classes, we came up with a set of habits of mind that we saw teachers 
trying to instill. And we're now looking at one of those closely to see whether it's learned and whether it transfers. The habits of mind that we saw being taught were learning to see visual acuity. Students are taught to look and see things they hadn't seen before. Learning to envision, kind of, you might think of that as spatial reasoning. Learning to generate mental images and manipulate them in your mind. Because students, teachers would come around all the time and say, why are you putting this white part over here? How would it look if you moved it over here? And so the student has to imagine it and mentally manipulate the white part and move it. Or what is the underlying geometry of this picture? Can you see how it's a triangle? So those are the kinds of questions that we saw that we saw teachers asking all the time that we thought were promoting spatial reasoning. Well, let me be a devil's advocate here. Okay. Habits of mind. Habits of mind are are indeed transferred, aren't they? They're habits of mind. Well, we don't know if they're transferred. So we... Well, excuse me. Let me not just say, I, I misspoke. I shouldn't say transferred. But if there is developed a habit of mind, it is a habit of mind. I see. A habit sounds like it's generalized, mm -hmm. right? We call these studio habits of mind that are ah. being taught in the, in the art studio. So we did put the word studio okay. on it. We haven't even demonstrated that they're learned. Now, that's what we're trying to do now. All we have demonstrated, we've looked at the teacher discourse, and we've said this is the kind, these are the things that the teachers are trying very hard to teach, and here's how they're doing it. Now we are going into a new study. We actually have um, three grants from the National Science Foundation to study transfer from the arts. Um, one is in visual arts, one is in music, and one is in theater. In our visual arts study, we are looking at the extent to which students learn to envision, to generate mental images and to manipulate them. Let's just call it spatial reasoning. We're looking at the extent to which students learn spatial reasoning from strong visual arts involvement, and that's just learning learning, that doesn't say anything about transfer, we're also looking at whether that transfers outside of the arts to geometric reasoning. When do we get away even from this general concept of transfer? You call the piece art for our sake. We used to say art for art's sake. Right. When do we get back to that? Well, isn't that the same I, as... It's, I'm, that's what I meant when I said I'm not opposed to transfer. I think if you look, I'm not opposed to the idea. I don't think it's bad to look for transfer. I just don't think we should justify the arts uh, in terms of what they do for other subjects. But you see, I'm not even talking about transfer. I'm talking about art for the sake of art. Okay. Well, I actually believe that the purpose of education is to get students to appreciate the most important human inventions. And those are the sciences, the humanities, and the arts. And I also think, and so an education without the arts is leaving out something critical to what humans have done. And I also believe that what the arts, an education in the arts can do that no ed education in no other area can do is to educate students in having aesthetic emotions, aesthetic reactions, feelings of awe. And I think that the arts are important in their own right for those, perhaps for those two reasons. But I would go on to say that we can also show that the arts require thinking and they, they stimulate important ways of thinking that are clearly used in other areas as well, like learning to see and spatial reasoning. Whether or learning these habits of mind in the art studio will then allow you to carry that habit of mind outside of the art studio to another kind of study is an open question that we're investigating now. Habit of mind aside, how do the arts fare, fare now in our schools? They're still minimal. There are... Well, when you say still, <laughs> I remember as a student in public schools here in New York City um, having to take art, right. having to take music, uh, not knowing that at some point in the future all those wonderful things would not be available. Right. When I say still, I mean they haven't miraculously gotten better in the last five years. Right. Yes, arts education has lost, has lost ground over several generations. And this is why you came under attack with your article. Yes, it's also why people are claiming that the arts raise test scores. The more the arts are under attack, the more advocates claim that the arts are crucially important for doing what everybody agrees is important, quote-unquote, which is raising test scores. 
So, so they, they're not people who are talking about the art for the sake of art. No, and people said to me, you're, you know, if you, if you say the arts don't raise test scores, you're throwing us back to arts for art's sake, and that argument doesn't work. And I said, don't give up so easily. We need to change the conversation. Don't sell out to the testing mentality. Even Obama talked about the, the, um, the, how the arts raised test scores, and he talked about some Chicago public school studies, which actually were not experimental studies, and you couldn't conclude that the arts raised test scores, but even he fell into that. Have you let him know better? Well, actually, I got interviewed for an article in the New York Times magazine before he was elected about um, these claims, and I, I had to say that there wasn't a lot of experimental evidence. How about our new Secretary of Education? Do we think he would buy this argument? I hope so, but I actually, I, I, I haven't read anything he's written about the arts, and uh, I don't know what he would say. It seems to me that there's so much to what you have written and to what you are saying and to what you are studying in your research uh, that um, the new administration is an administration that uh, would welcome well, maybe welcome is the wrong word, but would understand the critique I think that so. you're offering. I think so. They're open to new ideas. They're open to new ways of thinking, and I don't think they're hung up on the testing mentality. And yet that's part of the whole pragmatic approach, the practical approach that led to uh, an awful lot of people getting very upset by what you have written. I think it's, um, it's, in, it's American instrumentalism and it's American Philistinism. Um, I was at a conference in London about a year ago, and I mentioned this, and people at the conference were very surprised. They said, really? We don't justify the arts this way. But then I started getting emails from them, and they said, you know, we've started looking into this, and we found that the same kind of reasoning is creeping into our schools. Why? So money, I think it's dollars? money. I think it's money. Right. And that's not going to uh, be changed very no. quickly. And, you know, it's because... It's an easy outcome to test, test scores. It's actually a lot harder to look, to, to come up with good tests that look at learning to, look at whether you can see better, whether you can envision better. We also found that in our, in the arts classes that we studied, students were being trained to, to reflect. They were being trained to be very metacognitive because during these three hour classes, students would be working on a project and the teacher would circle around and would say, what are you doing here? Why are you doing it? Is this working? Isn't it working? And then there would be a critique session at the end where they would ask all those same questions. And you don't see that kind of focus on reflection outside of the art studio. So I actually argue that the, the way that arts classes are taught when they're taught well could be a model for non-arts classes. What about the, let me call them the best schools, mentioned Andover mm -hmm. as a uh, private institution. What about the public schools, the best arts teaching mm -hmm. in the public schools. Do you find them uh, concerned about art for the sake of art? Yes. I think arts teachers are not concerned about raising test scores. Arts teachers do not like these claims. Artists do not like these claims. The only people who like these claims are educational psychologists who have already made their name in saying that the arts raise test scores, and arts advocates who are trying, who have made their reputation and their funding base in saying that the arts raise test scores. Arts teachers absolutely don't think about what they're doing in terms of raising SAT scores. And there's some wonderful arts teachers. There's some terrible arts teaching going on, and there's some wonderful arts teaching. One of the schools that we studied was the Boston Arts Academy, which is a public uh, pilot school in Boston for Boston public high school kids who want to focus on the arts and they choose an art form to major in. We studied those majoring in visual arts. We also looked at a the Walnut Hill School for the Arts, which is a private residential school. But there was wonderful arts teaching going on in the Boston Arts Academy. And that's a very special school. I'm sure you would also find wonderful arts teaching in many other private school, public schools where, where students don't go to specialize in the arts. We don't have much time left, but I do want to pursue this um, about the rest of the country it sounds as though there is something parochial about these studies. You haven't limited yourself to New England, uh, have you? Well, actually, the Alameda 
county schools in California have taken up our studio habits of mind framework and they are using it. Many, many teachers now are adopting our framework and trying to um, change the way the arts are taught in the classroom. So, and Lois Hetland has been the person on our team who's been working out there in California. So we just chose two schools in New England because we, we needed local schools. I, does this mean that you are really primarily interested in curriculum development? No, I am primarily interested in research. I was interested in this from a scientific question. I was interested in the relationship between thinking in the arts and thinking outside of the arts. I mentioned that I have these two other studies going on. We have three longitudinal studies and I'm interested in them really for science, though they have policy implications. One is looking at the effect of music training on the brain. One is looking at the effect of theater training on, on perspective taking, theory of mind, and empathy. And the third is the looking at the visual, visual arts training and its effect on geometric reasoning. None of them relate to the SATs. None of them relate to the SATs, though geometric reasoning might be the closest, although there's much more focus on algebra than on geometry in the SAT. This no, whole notion of carryover, of transfer, oh, I, my saying to my students, though I didn't go to law school, my youngest son did, uh, go to law school, good training, mm -hmm. and I'm obviously thinking about transfer, movement, of disciplined thinking from one area to another. Uh, is this what your research will be doing? That's not an area that I've looked at, or, and I probably won't be looking at it, but I think that uh, I certainly heard the claim that training in philosophy and training in law trains the mind, and it will carry over. What will it carry over to? Probably to other areas that are similar, verbal reasoning, logically, the ability to logically analyze an argument. So it's near transfer, not far transfer. Great concept, isn't it, transfer? A very, very human one. Ellen Winner, thank you so much for joining me today on The Open Mind. Thank you. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. For transcripts of today's program, please send $4 in check or money order to The Open Mind, P.O. Box 7977, FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as an old friend used to say, good night and good luck. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.